Today, I intend to speak about the old rugged cross, a hymn that has remained incredibly popular over the years and decades. There's a fascinating story behind the creation of the hymn, and I thought I would share some details with you today. And before I go any further, I'd like to share a little joke with you. I suspect some of you have heard it before, but I hope you won't mind hearing it once again. It seems there was a small church in northeastern Ontario where the minister was given his final message before moving on to a much larger church in a city down south. The minister was known for giving lengthy, tedious, and boring messages that would go well into overtime. For the past 26 weeks, he had been speaking about the book of Leviticus. His final message was about Leviticus 27, the last chapter in the book. Because it was his final sermon to the congregation, the minister decided to put everything he had into the message. He was determined to give the congregation a special thank you gift, if you will. As a result, the message went into double overtime and then triple overtime. The people, however, were bored out of her trees. <laughs> Finally, the marathon sermon came to an end with many of the people sleeping in their seats. To mark the fact it was his final service, the minister asked the congregation to suggest one hymn they could sing to mark his send off. A sweet little old lady, one of the very few who had not fallen asleep said she knew a perfect hymn to mark the fact he would be leaving. And what would that hymn be, the minister asked. The sweet little old lady responded, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> so with that preamble out of the way, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we call on you to preside over our service this afternoon we take consolation in the fact your word never goes out void, despite the limitations and frailties of a speaker. May our hearts and minds be focused on learning more about you. May we become deeper committed in serving you. May we leave here with the view it was good to be here. And we say a special prayer for anyone in attendance who does not know you in a personal and real way. We pray they will accept you as their personal Savior and Lord, and the angels will rejoice as quoted in Luke 15, 7. And may all the honor and glory go to you, Heavenly Father. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our majestic Savior and compassionate Lord. Amen. <clears throat> a group of young punks set out more than 110 years ago to disrupt a gospel meeting. They encountered success as they prevented the gospel message from being effectively delivered that evening. But in the long term, their disruptive actions would prove to be a major victory for Christianity. In fact, it could be said the actions of the punks resulted in a spectacular and sensational victory for Christianity. Little did they know their disruptive actions would lead to the writing of one of the greatest gospel hymns of all time. And little did they know the writing of a gospel hymn would play a role in hundreds of thousands of people accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. No doubt an explanation is needed. The story is told of George Bernard, an evangelist who traveled across the American Midwest as well as southwestern Ontario. 
One night in 1912, Bernard was given a message at a gospel meeting in a small town in Michigan when things didn't go well. In fact, things went terribly. Five or six punks invaded the meeting and heckled Bernard without mercy throughout his message. For an evangelist in such a setting, it is said it is important to talk loud and fast to make it difficult for a heckler to get a word in edgewise. Should a person start heckling, the unwritten rule is people connected with a gospel meeting zero in on the heckler and politely ask him or her to be quiet. The heckler would be politely told arrangements could be made for them to have a one-on-one -on -one session with the speaker after the meeting. And if they still refuse to be quiet, the heckler would be politely told to leave the service. However, it's an entirely different situation when five or six hecklers invade a meeting. Websites given an account of what happened that dreadful night don't go into details, but it appears the hecklers were dispersed throughout the crowd. It was an organized attack against the gospel. It seems someone would stand up in the back right-hand corner and shout, your message is nonsense, preacher man. We have no time for you. And then someone else in the front left corner would shout, you can take your Bible and stick it where the sun don't shine. And then someone else in the center of the audience would stand up and shout, get out of town, you stupid old man. We don't want your type around here. Your gospel message is complete foolishness. Your message is for idiots. And on and on it would go. Before long, it doesn't make any difference how loud and how fast the evangelist speaks. The actions of the people dealing directly with the hecklers end up being ineffective. The hecklers gain the upper hand, making it difficult, if not impossible, for a speaker to deliver an effective gospel message to the unsaved. It is said Bernard was deeply frustrated by what happened that dreadful night in Michigan. It must have been heartbreaking for him. He put it all on the line to win the unsaved for Christ, and his actions were basically fruitless because of the hecklers. For consolation, Bernard turned to the Bible to reflect on the work of Christ on the cross. He later recalled having a vision in which he saw Christ and the cross as inseparable. As a result, he was inspired to write a gospel hymn. Often when accounts are given about the writing of a gospel hymn, mention is made of the words flowing from the writer's pen. Fanny Crosby, it is said, wrote the words to blessed assurance in a few minutes. John Newton wrote the words to amazing grace in one brief sitting before he hosted a regular weekly Bible study. And Joseph Scriven wrote the words to what a friend we have in Jesus as part of a letter he mailed to a seriously ill mother in Ireland. Bernard is credited with writing 300 gospel hymns, but this one would take much more time than all the rest. Bernard had the melody in mind for a hymn, but for some time, and for whatever reason, the words just wouldn't come. That is, until he had his encounter with the hecklers. The first verse for the hymn was completed by Bernard during a series of gospel meetings in Albion, Michigan. A few months later, the remaining three verses were completed in Polkagon, Michigan, where Bernard was leading meetings at a local church. 
the famous gospel hymn composer Charles Gabriel assisted Bernard with the harmony and the rest is history. Here are the words to the hymn that ranks as one of the greatest of all time. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Then comes the chorus, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Then comes verse two. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. After the chorus comes verse three. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Then after the chorus comes verse four. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. A short while later, Billy Sunday, the popular evangelist, decided to feature the hymn prominently at his crusades. In other words, it was like Billy Graham featuring Just As I Am at his crusades, or Dwight Moody featuring What a Friend We Have in Jesus at his revival meetings. As a result, the old rugged cross exploded in popularity. For some fascinating information about Sunday. He grew up in an orphanage and became a professional baseball player playing from 1883 to 1891. In 1887, Sunday encountered a gospel preaching team on a street corner in Chicago and ended up receiving Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. His life would never be the same. Before long, Sunday entered the ministry full time and became a noted evangelist traveling from town to town. He would often conduct his crusades in a gigantic circus tent, and it is estimated he was responsible for leading a mind-boggling 300,000 people to Christ. And with those 300,000 people coming to Christ, there can be no debate The him, the old rugged cross, played a role. Newspaper people of a day were always trying to trap Sunday with the view he had to be guilty of some type of crime. But try as they may, they couldn't find any wrongdoing in Sunday's life. As one wag said during the time, the only thing the media could accuse Billy Sunday of was stealing. You see, Sunday stole a whopping 246 bases during his baseball career and was noted for his speed and agility. In fact, in 1890, he led baseball with 84 stolen bases. When the newspaper people couldn't find anything wrong in Sunday's life, they resorted to attacking him on his colorful speaking style. They would paint a picture of him shouting and screaming and jumping around, stomping his feet, flailing his arms during his messages. The newspapers tried to make him appear as a madman, as a lunatic. Yes, that was Sunday's preaching style, but we need to put things into context. Sunday would be often preaching in a circus tent packed with hundreds and hundreds of people. 
In those days, he didn't have a microphone or any electronic device to promote his voice. To keep the attention of his large audiences, Sunday had to shout, stomp his feet, and flail his arms. Bear in mind that members of the audience would be coming and going throughout the service. If it was raining, you would hear the pitter-patter. Sunday was determined to keep the attention of his audiences, and he was a master at it. So it was completely unfair for people back then to criticize Sunday for his high-energy speaking style. There are few people I know who could speak to such a large group of people without a microphone and hold their attention. I suspect the likes of John Diefenbaker, Prime Minister of Canada in the 1950s could have done it. And I suspect Joey Smallwood, Premier of Newfoundland from 1949 to 1972 could have done it. But there are a few others from Canadian history. A lot of people have a mistaken opinion Sunday was a surname he assumed for evangelistic purposes. They think he had a surname like Smith or Jones and deliberately changed his name to Sunday when he became an evangelist. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, Sunday was akin to a showbiz name. Well, that's not the case at all. When Sunday's parents immigrated from Germany to the United States, an immigration officer anglicized their surname and made it Sunday. To blend into American society, that's the name they used. So his last name had absolutely nothing to do with show business. The old rugged cross is loved by the world for its melody and is loved by Christians for its words of personal trust in the cross of Christ. It remains one of the most cherished hymns of all time. In fact, when a list of the top 10 hymns is presented, it's a foregone conclusion the old rugged cross will be included. The hymn has been featured in countless hymnals over the years. The old rugged cross has also proven to be an extremely popular country gospel song. It has been recorded by the likes of Ernest Tubb, Jim Reeves, Johnny Cash, June Carter, Patsy Cline, Merle Haggard, Loretta Lynn, and Tennessee Ernie Ford. Unfortunately, Christians sometimes sing the old rugged cross without giving much thought to the words, and that's truly unfortunate. The late Billy Graham, speaking in Toronto in 1978, stated when he is at the entrance to the kingdom of heaven and they should ask what right he has to be there, Graham said, I won't say, Lord, I have read the Bible through a number of times, and I won't say, Lord, I preach to a lot of people down there. I'm going to say simply to the cross I cling. I come by the mercy and grace of God that was in Christ on that cross. I come because of the shed blood on that cross. Graham went on to state, when I see the cross, I see how terrible sin is because God sent his only begotten son to die such a horrible death for the forgiveness of our sins. God is saying from the cross, he loves you. It has been said the Bible is the world's greatest love story. The Bible clearly tells us for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's love is so immense 
so deep, so wide, so profound, so intense, so sincere, we are simply incapable of grasping it in its entirety. His love for us boggles the mind. Here we have the creator of the universe, and he comes to earth in the form of a lowly man. And the very people he created rejected him and put him to death. He was arrested under false charges and tried in a kangaroo court. They mocked him, savagely beat him, whipped him, tortured him, and crucified him on a hill with two common criminals on either side of him. And while Christ was dying in agony on the cross, they hurled cruel insults and abuse at him while his mother looked on. If you are the son of God, come down from that cross. If you can't come down, it's abundantly apparent you are an imposter. In fact, you are much more than an imposter. You are a deranged lunatic who had the audacity to pretend he was a son of God. You are a liar and a cheat. Yet, while Jesus was experiencing excruciating pain and fighting for every breath on the cross, he remained completely committed to the task at hand. Christ's response to the horrific pain, insults, and abuse was an 11-word sentence. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Those 11 words comprise the most amazing sentence ever uttered in the history of the world. Out of unfathomable love, he died for the forgiveness of our filthy sins and the process gave us victory over death. Christ stayed up on that cruel cross out of deep and amazing love. If he came down from the cross of Calvary, the handful of people gathered at the crucifixion site would have believed in him. They would have worshipped him. But there would have been no atonement for our sins and there would be absolutely no way we could achieve eternal life. Because he stayed up on the cross, tens of millions of people believe in him today. I'm convinced on this side of heaven, we would never be able to fully understand the scope of Christ's love for us. There is no documentation at all to support this view. But I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of the hecklers mentioned at the beginning of the message actually ended up becoming evangelical Christians. It sometimes seems those strongly opposed to Christianity end up surrendering their lives to Christ. Go on YouTube and you'll see all types of videos about former members of ISIS and key Islamic people becoming born-again Christians. You also see videos about staunch atheists surrendering their lives to Christ. We won't know until we get to heaven, but I personally wouldn't be surprised if I get to meet some of those hecklers. And I wouldn't be surprised to find out that 20 or so years after that disruptive gospel meeting in Michigan, at least one of the hecklers gave his life to Christ while the old rugged cross was being performed at a Billy Sunday crusade. In other words, God will not be mocked. In closing, there's a little story I'd like to share about the cross. It goes like this. Let a man go to a psychiatrist, and what does he become? He becomes an adjusted sinner. Let a man go to a medical doctor, and what does he become? He becomes a healthy sinner. Let a man achieve wealth, and what does he become? He becomes a wealthy sinner. Let a man join a church, sign a card, and turn over a new leaf, and what does he become? 
Well, he becomes a religious sinner. But let him go in sincere repentance and faith to the foot of Calvary's cross. And what does he become? He becomes a new creation in Jesus Christ, forgiven, reconciled the meaning and purpose in his life, and on his way to the marvelous fulfillment in God's will.